in a series. And as said, this one is the, the third one in a series of three. And like the previous times, we are going to take about one hour with our two speakers, who are Julia Pongatz and uh, Pierre Ibisch. Each of them will give a presentation of about 15 minutes and they will focus on the impacts of climate change on forests, the potential and challenges of reforestation and climate smart forest management. Uh, Julia is also part of the Lama Klima Project Consortium and Pierre works at the University of Eberswalde for sustainable development. My name is Inga Menke and I work for climate analytics and I will be your moderator today. Before we start, um, I would like to, to share the modalities of this webinar. First of all, we are recording the webinar and we will share the link afterwards. Um, you should have all received an email with two links to the previous two webinars, so we will do the same with this one and you can find it afterwards on our website. Then I would kindly ask um, those of you who haven't to rename yourself um, with your name and ideally your organization or institute. Of course, if you join privately, you can just use your name. You can do so by going to the participants list, right click on your name, and there you should have a button which is rename. Um, and also, I would kindly ask you to turn off your video. If you are encountering any technical issues, you can contact Michael Hergerty. Um, he's from Climate Analytics. You can contact him directly through the Zoom chat, and um, he can help you. Um, yeah, with whatever issue you have. Due to the time constraints, because we really want to stick to one hour and uh, the number of participants, we will not allow for an oral discussion, but we will use Slido, which uh, we have also done in the last two times. And how does Slido work? So you go to slido.do and you can key in the Slido code that is written here on the slide, so 010919. And there you can type any question you have on the webinar. And this is ongoing. You can basically start straight away when a question comes up during any of the presentations. Everyone else can see your comments or questions. And instead of, for example, asking the same kind of question, you can like a question that others have posed. This will change the order of the question. So it's not based on time, but based on interest. And we will tackle the questions based on interest. So those that received most likes will be tackled first. If you have a specific question um, to one of the speakers, so um, linked, for example, to Julia's presentation or to Pierre's presentation, you can also write at Julia or at Pierre. Um, and I think Mike can share the code again in the Zoom chat because we won't see the slides um, throughout the presentations. So. In terms of flow, we will um, take 30 minutes for presentations, 15 for each speaker, and only then we will move on to the questions. So if, if you have questions for the first speaker, please also put them on Slido so that we can tackle them after the second speaker is done. The first presentation will be by Julia Ponkatz, and she works as a professor at the Ludwig Maximilian Universität München, or LMU. And she's also the lead chair for physical geography and land use systems. She received her PhD from the MPIM and has worked as a postdoc at the Carnegie Institution's Department of Global Ecology in Stanford, California. Um, Julia has received several awards and is a member of different steering committees and contributed and contributes to the past and upcoming IPCC reports. As already said, she's also part of the Lama Klima Consortium and we'll introduce her work here today um, in the webinar. And I'm happy to hand over to Julia for her 15 minute presentation. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Inga. I assume you can hear me and see my presentation. Excellent, thanks. And thanks everyone for, for joining. So I already saw a few familiar names on the list. This is uh, very nice. Good. Um, let me start out right away. So this is a map um, of the forest cover as it would exist in the absence of any human interference. So you see a lot of in the tropics, a lot of also in the northern um, temperate latitudes. But now let's take that away, which has been cleared for agricultural purposes. So about 30% of the forest has been cleared in the past. 
And now, well, how much of the remaining forest is really untouched by humans? Well, we mask the wild areas out in orange now. And you'll see that of the forests, it's really not a lot that's gone. It's the northernmost um, forests that are gone a little bit here in the inner tropics. But most of the forest, that's the conclusion here, is managed. And this has likely an upward trend. Why is that? Well, because of the Paris Agreement, it puts additional pressure on land. There's um, several scenarios of how you can get down to a 2 or 1.5 degree target that um, was decided at the climate conference in Paris. These are three different archetypes of such scenarios to meet, match 1.5 degree. And they all say that by the middle of the century, the net emissions need to be um, zero and then become negative afterwards, meaning we have additional carbon sinks. And those carbon sinks really have to start earlier already to compensate for that we're not quick enough in getting our fossil fuel emissions down. Now we also need to reduce land use emissions to zero and then create sinks there. So the idea here is that because we've deforested in the past and released carbon into the atmosphere, we reverse that trend by afforestation. In some scenario that's sufficient and others it's not and you need more fancy methods. So you have large scale negative emission technologies in all of these scenarios, be it reforestation, afforestation, forest management, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, biojar enhanced weathering, and so on. So there's um, additional pressure on land here. Is this where we're going? So do we really create those things? Um, currently, no. So this first is um, the look on fossil fuel emissions and how they've evolved since 1970. It's the daily emissions. You see they've been increasing, right? A few dips here because of financial crises, but overall um, still an increase apart from what has been happening in the last few months with a steep decrease in um, emissions due to the corona lockdowns. But you see that the um, fossil fuel emissions, they started to level off maybe last year already. But the land use emissions, they did not. This, these are the land use emissions. We put them together always uh, as part of the Global Carbon Project's annual carbon budget. And they've not been um, going down in the last year, really saw an upward trend again. So currently um, we release about six gigatons of CO2 per year, which is about 1.7 gigatons carbon per year, depending on which unit you prefer, I put both numbers out. And why, what happened 2019? You may remember the press Amazon was on fire, right? And what's happening 2020? The same thing. These are the average deforestation rates over the last um, few years in the Amazon. This is um, what, what happened in 2019 here. This is now January, we're going into 2020 and you see deforestation rates are much higher than what we had. It's a record high, at least in the last 10 years. So we assume that the land use emissions will again um, go up. This is in stark contrast to what we need and what the Paris Agreement said we should do. Uh, this study compiles the options of mitigating climate change by nat nature-based um, solutions. It's a famous study by Griscom. And there you see um, avoided forest management, uh, sorry, avoided forest conversion. So this is clearly one that's a big point. So what's currently going on, we should stop and we should reverse it. We should maybe even do reforestation. There's also natural forest management that's up on this list. And when you compare it to other measures that are there on agriculture and grasslands, on wetlands and so on, you realize that those that refer to forests are those with the largest potentials. And they may also have other benefits when you look at air, biodiversity, water, soil, it's all something that's also could be achieved by altering the forest cover and the type of management. Mm -hmm. So um, assessments are that possibly up to 10 gigatons of um, CO2 per year or three gigatons of carbon per year could be removed, although these are extreme ends of the, of the assessments, right? The middle point is somewhere else. But how do we get to these high scenarios? And there I would like to show you one study which we performed, which gets to um, such high carbon uptake. So here's an example of a scenario with high mitigation potential by changing the forest cover. In this um, study, we were looking at a socioeconomic scenario that has a high CO2 price. If you have that, you value forests high and you get additional money in the system, which you could use to intensify agriculture. Therefore, you release um, pressure off the land. You have areas available that you could use to reforest. And we compare that to the RCP 8.5. Some of you may know it. It's kind of the business as usual scenario with high fossil fuel emissions with continuing deforestation. So that's our reference. And now we have the high CO2 price and things change a lot. 
this is the um, difference in forest cover that you would see with our high CO2 price scenario compared to the um, RCP 8.5. Forest cover changes um, increase is marked in red. Um, what you find is that in particular in the northern mid-latitudes, you have a lot of um, reforestation. We've cleared Europe in the medieval times. Now we can reforest and we're already starting to do so. In the tropics, it's mostly reduced deforestation that we're seeing as a signal. And the overall effect of this, when you put it into a um, model, we use the Max Planck Institute's Earth System model, so a comprehensive climate model that also captures vegetation atmosphere interactions. You find um, the following changes since present day um, in terms of terrestrial carbon stock. They're increasing by about 200 petagrams carbon by the end of the century. This is because the forest cover, this is the reference scenario, this is our afforestation scenario, increases in particular in the first half of the century, less so after. So our study concludes that we find about 8 million square kilometers um, more forest cover than in this business as usual scenario without interfering with food security in that case because of the high CO2 price. And it means a carbon sequestration rate of about 2 gigatons carbon per year or 200 by the end of the century. And in terms of temperatures, it would mean that temperatures are reduced by 0.3 degrees by the end of the century. So it's clear this is not the solution, right? We're facing several degrees temperature change if we're not reducing the fossil fuels down to um, zero very quickly. But 0.3 degrees is something um, substantial still, and 200 gigatons of carbon additional sequestration is something that clearly should be taken into account. Now, the question many ask is, well, these things stagnate, right? So you're regrowing your forest, but then the forest is there, and it's not taking up any CO2 any longer. And here the answer is no. There's at least two good reasons why this is not necessarily the case. The first is, old growth forests remain a sink. So look at this, we said the forest cover is not increasing very much in the second half of the century, but the CO2 that's sequestered on land still increases. And this is also something not just models find, but also um, observational data indicates. Um, this is a compilation um, by Sebastian Leusart, um, where they looked into forests, also old forests. Here you see several hundred years old, and it's a net carbon exchange for more than 500 forest plots in the temperate and boreal regions. And you see the carbon uptake is still positive. So there's still carbon uptake even for old growth forests. And part of the reason is that um, forests grow better under current um, environmental conditions because of things like CO2 fertilization. CO2 is beneficial for plant growth. Um, there's nitrogen deposition from industrial activities, for example, also partly in the boreal regions. Um, higher temperatures are beneficial for growth. There's a lot of reasons um, why this can happen. And this is um, a huge effect. So basically also because of these effects, um, the land, the terrestrial land, um, sink currently captures about one third of all our anthropogenic emissions each year. But there's high risk associated. So we don't know with extreme events, heat, drought, you get insect disturbances, you get fires and so on. So this is not a sink we can rely on necessarily for the long term. The other point is why things don't stagnate. We can continuously use forest material. We can manage the forest. And we can use that material to substitute fossil energy or to substitute energy intensive material. Cement creates a lot of emissions when produced. It. Steel is um, super energy intensive in production. You could um, alter that, use wood instead. You could, of course, also use the woody material and do carbon capture and storage. So store it away in the very long term, kind of reverse the geological um, perspective. Now this forest management has big effects too. So this is the um, stock change in biomass imposed by humans. So in this study led by, by Heinz Erb, we, we compiled um, remote sensing and inventory data to see what the actual biomass is compared to potential biomass. And this is the human interference with it. You see in some regions, we have uh, close to 100% of biomass removed by humans. But let's look closer. So we split this up by biome. Here you have different biomes and you see the entire biomass again as the entire bar. And the yellow shows what is really lost by clearing of the natural vegetation of the forest, for example. And this takes a, a lot away, but really similarly much is taken away by management. So forest management and other land management has contributed as much as really the clearing to the decrease in biomass. In land. Now this in itself is bad news for atmospheric CO2, but it's good news in terms of we can really um, play around with how we manage the forest and increase biomass stocks. And of course, it's a whole lot of material that we're removing that we could use wisely in terms of CO2 storage. 
So um, there's one more point I would like to make here, and I'm stopping now with carbon because policy is focused all on carbon. And my conclusion from the last years um, of work is it should not. So why do we know this here in the middle is a mini forest and the other is grassland? It's not because we see the carbon, it's because it looks different. Noticeably, it's much darker. The forest would absorb more solar energy and so the reflectivity or albedo is, is much um, lower than for the grassland. Also, you realize that the um, shape is different, it's much rougher, therefore it would induce turbulences which would increase um, the energy transfer away from the surface into the atmosphere. And now these effects on, on um, surface energy fluxes and hydrology, we usually call the biogeophysical effects. Compared to that, you have photosynthesis and carbon storage together with the nutrient balance changes. These usually are called biogeochemical effects. And this, the CO2 and greenhouse gas aspect is the sole focus of politics currently. But um, the other, the biogeophysical effects are super important and they're interesting and complex because um, Transferring more energy away from the surface would mean the forests cool the surface. But on the other hand, because it's darker, it absorbs more solar energy, it would warm it. And it's not clear which effect dominates in which region. So there's a large potential um, to really screw it up. If you plant a forest for carbon sequestration, it may go all wrong, but you could also create additional benefits. And of course, we as a researcher, we are looking for the second point. So the big question is, how can we achieve mitigation and adaptation at the same time? So how can we reduce the atmospheric CO2 concentration and therefore global mean temperatures, but also reduce local temperatures by the biophysical effects? And again, we will, um, ah yeah, and one more point that makes it interesting and complicated is these local effects, um, they're of course turning non-local because the moisture, the heat, the CO2, they're all transported away with the air masses and then affect the rest of the ground. Because this is so complex, we turn again to models to um, try separate out these different effects. And I spare you in the methods, um, we, we evaluated it against observations, it's looking fine overall. So just um, trust me for the purpose of this talk here. These are the local effects from our Earth system model that you would get when you deforest it everywhere. So in your mind, you can also flip the sign if you're interested in afforestation. And these are the local um, energy and, and water flux changes in terms of temperature effect. What you see is um, that the change that you get with having a forest there is one, two, three degrees different. A forest makes it up to three degrees um, or more cooler in most regions, not the high boreal regions, but in the temperate and the tropics. So this is what you have to consider for adaptation and local sustainability, because it means you could locally reduce your temperatures by several degrees and therefore adapt to climate change. But of course, there's the non-local effects. These are the non-local um, biophysical effects. And then you would also need to consider the CO2 effects, of course. And so when you're a, a politician at a climate conference, people are not asking you about your population back home. They're asking you about what you contribute to mitigating global climate change. And therefore, for these politicians, the global mean is what matters. And on the global mean, the local effects aren't all that big because they're compensating. They're not big. They're not happening on the ocean. So globally, they're small. The non-local effects, by contrast, they're bigger. They're also occurring over the ocean. They're three times as strong in the global mean, um, but also in the opposite side. But the CO2 emissions for these um, deforestation scenarios or reforestation scenarios would be dominating the picture on the global scale. So this means you have to consider adaptation and mitigation together, and then you get the complete picture. And that this is um, not just something that's relevant for forest cover changes like afforestation or deforestation, I would like to show you one last study where we again looked into management, forest management, also other land management, and compared what really a deforestation, for example, would mean compared to a difference only in land management. So on the right picture, you see the natural um, wildlife preserve forest compared to a heavily managed forest. You see, um, ground-based observations with FluxNet, but also satellite information with MODIS, you see the change in temperature, also the one in albedo, but let's focus on temperature. So again, we see this picture that land cover change deforestation has an effect of several degrees um, on, on, um, on the local scale. But now when you look at management differences, you find it's the same. It's the same order of magnitude, it's the same numbers. So management is this. Thanks, I'm almost done. So land management is as important as the land cover change is, yet it's hardly considered in the models 
and it's not considered currently in politics. And this brings me to my conclusion. So there's a large mitigation potential in reforestation and afforestation and in forest management. I showed you those comprehensive studies, comparing it also to other types of nature-based solutions. But what's really novel in, um, in, in the public um, knowledge is that there's a very large adaptation potential via biogeophysical effects. And they're so far ignored in policy. And this brings us again um, back to Lama Klima, because forest management and reforestation is something we want to consider in Lama Klima, which is integrated a view of adaptation on the local scale and mitigation for the global need. And with that, this, um, I thank you very much uh, for, for listening to me. And um, I'm happy to, to hand over to Pierre, who will now give you the, really the, what it looks like on the ground and what you can do there when you turn away from the global perspective. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Um, yes, very interesting. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to already um, go on Slido and ask those questions to Julia. But before we answer the questions, we will hand over to Pierre Ibisch. Pierre is a professor for natural conservation at the Eberswalde University of Sustainable Development. Um, and he's a former dean from the Faculty for, of Forest and Environment. His focus area are on biodiversity conservation, uh, system theory, global change ecology and adaptation. And for more than 10 years, he has had research professorships for biodiversity conservation and natural resource management under climate change. So he's quite, has quite a lot of expertise. Um, he has extensive experience also in the implementation of adaptation of conservation to climate change in Europe and also beyond. And we are very excited to have him here today. And I would like to hand over now to Pierre. You have also 15 minutes, thank you. Thanks a lot, Inga. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, Julia, for, for the great uh, talk. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to continue actually where you've stopped uh, and, and look at the ground level and uh, check how much, well, the state of forest matters uh, in, in terms of contributing to climate change mitigation and adaptation. This is a picture I took yesterday around the corner here in Eberswalde, and this is a canopy of a beech forest, which is clearly suffering. And there was quite a chain of events here. There was formerly, uh, well, a completely covered uh, beech forest, then th something happened, the canopy was uh, damaged, uh, and uh, there's obviously a suffering of the trees in the recent extreme hot and, and dry years. And, uh, well, one of the hypotheses would be the suffering is even worse due to the change of, of the system. So there's a lot of uh, complex uh, feedback loops involved, uh, involving macroclimate, also microclimate, and the state of the forest and its capacity to cool and uh, mitigate. Well, this is a picture from the Carpathians. This is the uh, other extreme, I would say, almost no comment necessary, old growth forest, uh, vast area, very well uh, regulating its own stand climate, but also local and regional climate, uh, well, contributing humidity and, and uh, well, also to the landscape temperature management. The big question is what happens if we use the forest for whatever purpose, this is an area currently salvage locked due to dieback of uh, spruces. What happens here to the climate on the ground and uh, what is the feedback uh, related result then for, well, the uh, potential of this area to become forest again. So what we see, of course, in these extreme years even tree planting is becoming ever more difficult. And once uh, forest management has clear cut vast areas, it can become more difficult to get these little plantlets uh, started. Here we can see here some pines uh, dying back. Uh, what uh, is the uh, well, in, in conceptual basis and, and background of the interaction of vegetation, forests, and, and, and climate? Without going into details now, uh, there is uh, this uh, basis of uh, ecosystem thermodynamics. And for quite a while, we know already that uh, the quality of vegetation matters. So more dense, um, higher vegetation, uh, more mature biomass-rich vegetation is uh, cooling. 
uh, whilst uh, well managed and, and uh, heavily used vegetation uh, would be heating up more easily. Recently, Zellweger et al. showed the importance of microclimate in forests, uh, locally being more important for the uh, flora uh, than macroclimate change. And uh, this has been shown various times that the intensity of management would influence uh, the temperature regime, the cooling and buffering regime, and possibly then also the health and resilience of the forest ecosystem. So let's have a look here at a local case study, uh, northeastern Germany, north of Berlin an area which is uh, characterized by uh, well, a gradient of our capital metropolitan area uh, here uh, northwards to an area which belongs to the most forest rich uh, regions in Germany. And of course, it's patchy. We have all types of, of land use, uh, quite interesting for studying the uh, impact of different ecosystem types on uh, climate, microclimate, and uh, here we want to have a look at surface temperature. So we use uh, MODIS data. This is a, a progress report. This is work in, in progress. We're looking at a time series, 17 years uh, of, uh, well, all daily temperatures in this region, and we try to understand how the different ecosystem types perform. This is a picture showing the mean temperature taking into account only June, July, August, so summer temperature from Berlin above 30 degrees and then here in the north some areas with lakes but also forests uh, going uh, well not beyond 18, 19 degrees in average, in the long term um, average. So here we see already there is a clear relationship and this can be investigated if we look at the modus pixels quite large, one square kilometer, we would see that, uh, well, the water bodies are in terms of the temperature, the average temperature are below average, as well as the forests. And some forests are seem to be cooler than uh, others. So this is interesting also that, uh, well, there might be a difference between the native broadleaf forests and the pine plantations, which are very relevant here in, in this um, area. If we look at uh, different temperature bands, it's also interesting. So we can have a look at the temperatures in the different ecosystem uh, types and, and the pixels. Uh, for example, here between 20 to 25 degrees or 25 to 30 degrees, we see it's stable. So like forests are always cooler, water anyway, but it looks like that the, it, at higher temperature bands, uh, the cooling capacity, the relative cooling, cooling capacity is even higher, which is quite interesting. So if we look at the same map here, the modus uh, map uh, for the, all the days, you see here the number of the days in, in brackets uh, during the 17 years uh, from minus 10 to minus five, up here to 35 to 40 degrees, uh, we clearly see, well, uh, Berlin always is a hot place, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, and then, well, the, the agricultural lands uh, heat up more uh, at, at higher temperature bands actually than forests. So the relative cooling capacity and, and buff buffering of forest, this is the hypothesis, uh, increases uh, with higher temperatures. If we look at uh, our pixels, these one square kilometers, uh, and, and look at the shares of the different ecosystem types. Uh, it's interesting, we can see like if we increase the share of deciduous broadleaf forests from 50%, 60, 70, uh, the temperature of uh, the uh, pixel goes down. So we understand this would be the cooling capacity or contribution of a certain ecosystem type on a landscape level. And we can, can compare to pine forest to water. We see water is actually uh, yeah, cooling more uh, effectively with higher shares than the forest, but there's also a difference between uh, broadleaf and pine. And in, in different temperature bands, just without going into details, the effect is more pronounced. So in a way, we can uh, have the temperature uh, range uh, and, and look at this um, slope of, of, of change, actually, 
and uh, we feel this can be a quantitative measure of the cooling contribution of different ecosystem uh, types. And there we see, yes, water is uh, cooling ever better at higher temperatures. Uh, pine is, uh, well, staying behind up to, from, from certain temperature levels um, onwards. So uh, this is actually showing, yes, uh, clearly there is an ecosystem systemic cooling capacity of the forest. So it matters how much forest we have in the landscape. We have to uh, discuss this more intensively. If we talk about adaptation to climate change, we need a vision of a landscape temperature management. And uh, this is something that can buy us some time uh, whilst global warming uh, goes ahead. If we go even a little uh, deeper into uh, the forest, we also uh, do microclimatic measurements uh, with uh, temperature log lo uh, loggers uh, now for some years in different types of forest where we try to understand how, how much the biomass and the stand characteristics would affect the uh, cooling and buffering capacities of, of the forest. So this would be a typical pine plantation here, uh, typical for northeastern Germany. Here we have the uh, average maximum temperatures at different plots. So we look at 69 uh, plots. Mean maximum temperature for the hottest days, above 20 degrees. And uh, here we have the different forest uh, plots. Actually here we have all pine plantations and down here we have native uh, broadleaf uh, beech forest. And what we can see, uh, well, there is a relationship from temperature to uh, a biomass, actually, in, in cubic meters per hectare. The more biomass we have on the plot, the cooler the area. And the extreme, uh, extremist difference regarding now the uh, average maximum temperature is eight degrees. So this is a lot if we look at critical temperature thresholds, physiologically relevant uh, thresholds, uh, more biomass is cooling the forest. And uh, the same, and this is not surprising, uh, uh, is, is uh, right if we look at the canopy coverage, there is a well, subtle correlation, of course, between biomass and canopy coverage. Again, uh, this is uh, the same uh, analysis, mean maximum temperature, but here the canopy coverage for the hottest days, but in 2019. Again, we have a difference of more or less eight degrees between the hottest biomass poor canopy coverage uh, poor plot compared to the uh, well most uh, close to nature ones. It's not only the cooling, it's also the buffering that matters and, and that is also relevant uh, to organisms. Here we have, uh, well, the diurnal temperature range for uh, 39 hot uh, days and the different colors here indicate the biomass and we would see the biomass rich stands do not heat up so much. We have understood this. Uh, and this, of course, then in result means uh, there is less fluctuation, there is more buffering. And this is relevant to also the productivity, the stability and uh, resistance of uh, the forest. So uh, in, in conclusion, uh, whatever we do in the forest, it's not only about harvesting trees, it's uh, directly related to uh, the management of the microclimate and uh, then of course it scales up it's also landscape temperature management and we have to discuss how much we can use should use or how intensively we shall uh, extract biomass uh, from forest when we know there is a, a clear uh, correlation between the cooling and buffering capacity and the retention of uh, biomass. So here we have a clear, not conflict, but we have to decide what we want to, uh, 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 well, stress here. It's, is it the provisioning services, uh, timber extraction? Is it better to have timber than in long-lived products? Is it uh, better for mitigation? I guess something that can be discussed a lot. Or is it about regulating services, uh, interesting for the people on the landscape level, but also relevant to the forest itself, its resistance and resilience. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.
Um, I would now move to Slido and I will share my screen. Okay, I hope it's visible to all of you. Um, thank you to those who have already posted some questions. I see there's some directed uh, towards Julia for the start. Um, I think we take one of the comments first, even though it's not um, marked uh, first, because I think uh, it's mostly a, a thank you for a point made. Uh, so it says, uh, Julia, thank you for taking over brilliantly the message I've defended for years regarding biophysical effects. So thanks, Julia. And exactly. then we will move <laughs> to the first question, um, which is highlighted, should be highlighted now. Let's see if I can highlight it here. Uh, to what extent does agricultural intensification could have an impact on global warming? by preventing deforestation? And where do you see limitations? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, thanks for, for that. And it's a very hard one to answer. So it, my main message is, again, we have to be very careful of what, what we're doing. Um, if you remember last, the last webinar, we spoke about um, irrigation. And of course, if you, if you achieve the agriculture intensification by irrigating, you could um, locally cool the climate, but you have more water vapor globally in the atmosphere and so on. You're changing atmospheric circulation. You, yeah, there's other ways of how you can can alter the the um, how you can create higher higher yields um, by planting different types of crops, for example, by doing double harvesting and so on. And it needs to be very carefully assessed in which ways you do this agriculture intensification. If this is the way how you would go about to provide more area for planting forests. So uh, on the local scale, for small scale studies, we understand it pretty well, but um, largely we're missing still fundamental understanding on this. Uh, Pierre, do you want to add anything? Not to this question now, no. All right. Thank you, let me move on again to Julia. On Julia's slide on albedo impacts versus other effects, very interesting. Did this image include aerosol effects or not? Um, and does the dynamic work in boreal um, context? Um, so the aerosols, we don't consider. There's a few models that do consider it. Um, it's very hard to capture the aerosol effects of vegetation because it's really species dependent. Um, but it's important, for example, in the tropics, right? You have more cloud condensation nuclei by the aerosols emitted from vegetation, these BVOCs forming more clouds and being relevant for microclimate as well. Um, so this is also something that's, that should be um, included for a comprehensive view. The boreal behaves very differently um, from the rest of the world. So there we saw this overall cooling effect of the biogeophysical effects when you clear the forest, which has been recognized 20 years ago and then led to the notion that we should really clear the boreal forest and we are saved. Um, but of course, so, so meanwhile, we, we found out that this applies most likely only to the very far boreal regions that we haven't touched yet. So they would not be available to re reforestation. But in all regions that we have the potential to reforest, the carbon aspects are most likely dominating over the stark albedo effect that you have because the boreal forests are so dark and therefore would tend to warm the climate locally. But there's a lot of literature I can point you to um, specifically on, on this and if the boreal forest contributes a warming or a cooling. Thank you very much. Um, the next question goes to Pierre. Uh, how could you explain the difference between pine and deciduous forests? Is this only because of the size of leaves? No, I think it's, uh, well, about the ecosystem property, which we would call thermodynamic efficiency, which is uh, related to all the effects that Julia explained. In a way, it's about uh, the amount of energy that is captured by the system. So when we have a more biomass rich system, a more complex system, we would expect there is more energy uh, captured. But then indeed, uh, it also matters, at least in the short term, uh, the biomass itself, which is uh, related to thermal inertia, which I can see in the third question here. Indeed, this is, seems to be a relevant uh, effect, the quantity of water stored in the system. 
And this is something we have to discuss much more also, like how water is in, involved in, in uh, this uh, complex relationship between forest microclimate and, and macroclimate. Um, and uh, so this would be, just flipping here, uh, uh, yeah, also targeting this issue of uh, forest management that influence the forest uh, climate here quite uh, diff quite challenging now to discuss this uh, with the foresters who think that it could be good to uh, open up the canopy and and give more sp individual space to trees and and so on but uh, there is a clear risk that uh, the destruction of the microclimate uh, would hamper the uh, health of of the system the resistance uh, of of the system and uh, here I feel often we discuss in a rather under complex way also the contribution of forest use uh, to carbon management. Uh, I, I was a little nervous even when I, I read some studies that uh, predict how globally, uh, like the study published by, by PIC, uh, how, how globally we, we could uh, contribute to the sequestration of carbon by uh, using forest more intensively. Uh, and, and storing away the carbon in long-lived uh, products. This is uh, ignoring, of course, that the extraction of, of forest biomass uh, would uh, weaken the systems and actually can be highly counterproductive. So this is really a discussion we need to have. How, how intensive, uh, well, is, is it uh, tolerable to manage the forest and uh, even like efforts of adapting forests to climate change by opening them up and, and planting new trees into the system, but weakening the integrity can be completely counterproductive. Uh, Julia, do you want to react in any way? Yeah, it's clear that we have to be very, very careful with the way we, we manage the forest, with the species selection also. And while I already explained, it's very hard to say which way, which type of management goes for agriculture, it's even harder for forests because we're facing another time perspective. The forest we're planting now, we can't just change like we can change a crop species in the next year, but we will have to, to live with that for hundred years. And therefore we really have to anticipate also what is um, resilient under which type of future climate. And it, it's a trivial uh, insight, but it's relevant always. I, I mean, uh, in, in, as you said, you have annual crops and you change them from year to year. But in a forest, you can easily uh, cause irreversible changes. When you cut some trees that are hundreds of years old, they won't be back in, in, in the next few minutes. No, but it takes uh, hundreds of years or even they do not come back because you, you shift the system uh, to another uh, state or you contribute to, to, to the shifting to another state and uh, so this is, is the problem often also related to all these ideas of, of uh, forest-based bioenergy uh, like wood, wood, burning wood would be carbon neutral yes in the long term as we know it would grow back but only if it grows back and with uh, like progressing climate change we shall not be that uh, well take not uh, this uh, for, for granted. So uh, under a precautionary principle, I would say, okay, hands off and, and uh, leave the forest, especially the old ones, which are obviously better self-regulating, more uh, intact, uh, still sequestering carbon, as you've shown, and, and which is uh, shown by several studies. Uh, so I, I would uh, yeah, be careful with uh, too, uh, too much intervention. Thank you. Then I think we can move to the next question, which is also to Pierre. You explained that forest management influences the forest microclimate, but how much does it affect the climate in surrounding non-forested areas? Right. This is uh, about this uh, um, methodology we are exploring now, uh, which is modus based, where we have the large pixels and where we check the uh, share of different ecosystem types and, and this is exactly about that. There is a halo effect, I would say, around uh, forests and we still have to understand how, how big, of course, around the lake you have cooler conditions benefiting uh, forests, but also forests would benefit agricultural lands uh, and open lands would uh, harm actually forests, something we see now a lot. 
uh, I'm not sure how how wide this this effect uh, is, but it makes a difference. So uh, we, we, if we look at the shares of different ecosystem types in the modus pixels, uh, the combination matters. And, and I guess this can be uh, quantified. Thank you. Um, and then we are tackling a question to both of you. So I, maybe Julia can start. Seeing the positive effects on MA, how would you convince politicians, for example, the Brazilian president, to protect the forests and to manage the forests? I'm not entirely sure what M slash A is. Me neither. <laughs> but we can assume possibly um, that it helps with, with um, climate and or the ecosystem state, since it's the both of us. Um, yeah, that's the, the tough part. So. Currently, as, as we see what's, what's going on in Brazil, right, also part of, partly covered by, by COVID, um, the, the deforestation rates just continue as crazy. And it's partly not, so the problem doesn't only lie in this one country that does the deforestation, but really an entire market system. We know that as well. So the forest is not cleared because Brazil needs all the land for domestic consumption, but because most of the soil has been exported to Europe and now recently to China. And that's a lot of international market considerations that need to be captured. And in that respect, so, so we need to think if it's really the wisest decision to displace land use from other countries to tropical regions where we still have the pristine forest that we're now clearing, while we may be able to, to um, use land that does not require high carbon density forests to be cleared for additional um, food production. So this is something where the international community needs to help. But then of course, um, in Brazil, what's the problem there? Well, there's the local stakeholders that are involved. So those that vote for government need to be convinced that it's a good idea to keep the forest there. And for that, you, you need to make sure that the benefits of a forest cover is communicated and evident for those that are living there. And I think when you, when you look at these um, local effects, it becomes clear, right? So if, if suddenly by clearing the forest, you, you have a several degrees warmer temperature there, the living conditions are altered. And these are the tropical regions. We're already at the edge of temperature, of, of, the, of the temperature range where, where people and ecosystems can, can live well. And I think this is not becoming clear enough. And these, we are currently triggering long-term effects, degrading the forest even further by altering local conditions, having the forest edges, the forest degrades even further, contributing finally also to global climate change. This is not made clear enough how really the local sustainability perspective is very much in line with the um, global climate mitigation perspective and could be a very strong point also to convince a Brazilian government. So I found out MA is mature age, so we're talking about... Yeah. Yeah. Old okay, forest. That's my answer. Keep the forest there. It was fitting. Yeah. Just, just um, uh, I'm allowed yeah. to, to add something. I, I feel the evidence is out there. So and no, and and so it's possibly about how to communicate it. Indeed, as you said, Julia, uh, uh, if you clear the forest, the uh, not only on the local scale you get the heat on, but it's also happening then regionally and, and nationally, and then this is related to the hydrology and uh, then they would affect actually the productivity of, of the fields in, in the midterm uh, which are replacing the forest so uh, it's it's uh, yeah very critical also in terms of water i feel brazil has already seen water scarcity in in the mega cities and and uh, is wondering where the water has to come from it won't be more water if you have a hotter landscape thank you um, I think, let me move on to the next question, which is directed at Pierre. Good, um, yeah, yeah. This is a good question. What uh, are the exact mechanisms and contributions of, of the various uh, properties of the forest uh, that uh, cool? This is something we are right now trying to, to check with uh, well, more uh, complete statistical analysis, more data, uh, to understand what effect actually has the biomass versus the canopy uh, coverage and, and so on. So therefore we have uh, also 
lots more of, of, of data on, on the forest, like dead wood and living wood, and uh, uh, well, also the different functional types and so on. So this is work in progress. Yeah, but I feel uh, canopy density and uh, biomass will be the most relevant drivers of cooling. And maybe actually the message is it's also the biomass. So canopy uh, uh, structure and density is quite logically logical, more shade, it's cooler, but it's uh, just more than that. And I feel this is really interesting. And this is, again, I, I mentioned it, it was asked uh, related to thermal inertia, which is uh, coupled to the water contents of the ecosystem being so relevant also in other contexts. Thank you. Yeah. I, I feel we had a clarification in the chat. Yeah, I just saw it. Means, and the clarification that MA means mitigation and adaptation. So just to complement um, the previous, the answer to the previous question. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, Pierre. I think we can move on to the to the next question. Great this talks, still thank to you. The lake. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's related to the other question. No? So there is an edge effect. I would say always a positive and a negative edge effects from one ecosystem type to another. Um, so lakes, yes, uh, make a difference as much as forests uh, do. So more, we also clearly see that uh, the critical mass matters. So larger forest patches are, are cooling uh, better than uh, small fragments, which is logical. Thanks. And now we move to a comment um, for Julia. And the comment is, I think we need to be careful regarding teleconnections from re deforestation, as in our models, it is true, but for relatively large scale changes. Yeah, I agree with Natalie on, on that, of course. So um, our models investigate large scale deforestation. And therefore, of course, we also see large scale non local effects. And we go down to the ground, you would measure it on a much finer scale on a hectare scale, really. And then of course, the non local effects play out um, differently. And also the pattern of land use heterogeneity is something um, very important. So I think this is the next step our models are going to because we're now moving with higher computational capacities also to really high resolution models. But one interesting aspect I would like to, to mention here that's related to this is that um, we still, so a lot of people still think that um, models are wrong because they don't match observations. When you look at the biogeophysical effects of deforestation, for example, the models find much more of a cooling than all the observational data that has come out in recent years um, is showing. And um, the solution really is in that observations do not capture the non-local effects. But reality has them, of course, because reality knows that so, so the wind will take away whatever energy and water change has occurred um, over the canopy. So in rea reality, we have it. But when we observe really locally one grassland site versus a forest site, these non-local effects cancel out by definition, and you only observe local effects. And this has led, um, even in science, to a big misunderstanding that um, the models are wrong, they're not capturing the observations, while in reality, really, the models are right, and the observations are just showing the local effects. And the non-local ones we saw have a different sign change. And I think, so, so Natalie, of course, you, you, you know this, um, but it's something that, that needs to be communicated better to um, to politicians also that um, the models are better than we thought because we now understand these processes that are involved. Thank you very much. Um, and we have one last question for Pierre. Mm -hmm. So a participant that joined late and asks about the, um, whether the effects will be different in areas that is largely grassland like the savanna ecosystem. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think it's a good question. We haven't checked uh, tropical or subtropical regions, uh, but I would expect indeed that the effects are comparable. Even if we look at our study area, we have 
about half of, of the region covered by anthropogenic uh, steppes, uh, like agricultural lands, uh, not so much natural uh, grass uh, land. So we would have the same effects between the different ecosystem types and trees and forests definitely make a, a difference everywhere. So uh, yeah, good thing to be explored. Thank you very much. Um, I think we were able to answer all questions, which is great. Um, and I think we can therefore come to the end of this webinar, very on time. Um, I'm just quickly gonna share my screen. Oh, it's already shared, what was it? Um, yeah, I want to thank all of you for participating. Um, I thought it was very interesting and also thank you very much for the interesting questions and discussions. Thanks to both speakers. Um, yeah, it's sadly the last Lama Klima webinar of this series, but those of you who have signed up um, or who said that they are interested in hearing more about Lama Klima, you will soon receive our first newsletter. And um, for those of you who want to share this webinar further or you want to look at any of the presentations again, we will share the link on our website, so you can find them under the Lama Klima project um, to the recording of the webinar. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for your interest and for your active participation, and I hope you still have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>